Okay. I'm going to skip this part because we have a fun part at the end that you're going to miss. Um, uh, this is, um, again, if I don't have a remote debugger uh, and I want to capture a waterfall chart, PCAP perf is a way to set up a uh, wireless hotspot on your laptop running TCP dump connect to it from your phone, capture the PCAP file, and then view a waterfall chart from that. Um, and so it's a little complicated to set up. The thing that I love about it is it works for every phone. So I can sit with every mobile device I have connected to this network, and I can capture a waterfall chart on every one of them using a single setup. So I like that. Um, okay, let's skip to the fun part. What time is it? Yeah, so I've already gone over time. So we'll skip straight to the fun part. Okay, I think this will work. Um, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so there's this other project I built called uh, Browser Scope. Lindsay Simon runs it now. Um, and it's for benchmarking, uh, you know, performance and other capabilities of browsers. Uh, you can see we've got um, seven, six or seven standard suites. I wrote the networking performance suite. There's the ACID3 test. There's a test for CSS selectors, rich text edit control security. You can see how different browsers compare. All the data is crowdsourced. So you, we just it, wait for people to come here and say, yeah, go ahead, run all the tests on my browser. And so it's really cool because um, people who do this kind of thing in a lab they, you know, someone emails them and go, there's a new version of Opera out, and they go, oh, okay, next week we'll have that available. And for us, all the browser teams know about this, and most of them use it. And so we actually see results for browsers before they launch, because the browser teams are testing them here. And so we don't have to do any work. We don't have to deploy new hardware or new browsers, especially for mobile devices. That would be so hard. We just get the data from people out there who are running the tests. Um, and none of the tests are time-based, so things like what connection speed you're on um, don't matter. Um, but another capability of Browser Scope is to create your own test suite. And we don't show those in the defaults, but you can tweet about them and um, gather data. So that's what we're going to do right now. So here's the instructions, and I can, you know, create a, uh, uh, I forget where the link is, uh, blah, 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 oh, here. I can like create my own and I already created one and here's the key and so I went to some code uh, on my server and I added that key to this test page and what does this test page do? Um, it, that's not it, that's not it, oh there's that, ah here it is, okay. So it tests whether if I load, so uh, it's really good to have the onload event fire as early as possible because there are these busy indicators in the browser like the status bar and the tab icon that show activity and some users are put off by that. They don't think they should start interacting with the page until those busy indicators are finished. Um, and so, you know, the sooner you can make that happen, the better. Also, people still attach code to the onload event, like setting focus to the username field. I don't know about you, but as soon as the username and password fields open up, I click on the username field, I type my username, I tab to the password field, I start typing my password, the onload fired, and set the focus back to the username so the people watching me do my demo now see me typing my password in the username field. And so, you know, it's really good to, for, you know, that activity as well that's attached to the onload handler to get the onload handler to fire as early as possible. So if I load scripts dynamically, and by that I mean, you know, I say like um, create a new image, create a new image, set the source, right? That will cause the image to download. If I do that, um, does that block the onload event? Because if it doesn't, that would be a really cool technique to get the onload to fire sooner. People feel the page is ready sooner and the images can uh, file in. So here's a test that just uh, measures that and then sets the results and sends it back to browser scope. So now I just ran it once or twice. Did I? I think I did. I'll run it again. 
It's got two images. The first one is fast, the second one is slow. And it says it did block the window on load, but it also beaconed that back to browser scope. So here's my results. I wrote this as I was standing on the stage before I started, um, and I tested it once to make sure it was working well. And now if I reload the results, yeah, now I have two tests. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect data on this test from everyone in the room. How are we gonna do that? This is the fun part. So uh, we're going to uh, run this app that I built um, that is never gonna see the light of day until someone takes it over from me because I don't have the time to do it. Um, oh, here, I'll do it here, okay. Uh, there, okay, I'm gonna go to partyline.org Chugga, 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 chugga. Okay, there we go. Oh, I have to go to the admin page, sorry. You're gonna go there. Everyone get out a mobile device or a laptop um, and go to partyline.org. Okay, I'm gonna create a new party. The party's gonna be box and is created by me. I'm gonna get rid of the test party that I was using earlier. Okay, now we've started a party, and again, I wanna show off my UI design skills. Okay, now go to partyline, go to partyline.org. Morris, you're not gonna do it? Okay, um, Morris knows not to trust me, so all of you guys are in trouble. So uh, here, I'll go to it on this guy. Uh, boom, just to make sure it's working. And uh, try not to let your uh, screen um, go to sleep. So, you know, keep moving it around and stuff as we're doing this. Okay, 47 people are in so far. At about 50, WebSocket starts crapping out, depending on the network. Maybe we're all on, uh, on mobile. Um, okay, so uh, what's party line? Party line, I created this mostly for myself for conferences because I feel people go to conferences, they go to these public events, almost everyone in the room has a smartphone, and um, you know, I'll admit, like here, there's a pretty low level of interaction, right? I've been pretty aggressive about getting people to participate, and you guys haven't delivered. So, speaking frankly. So, um, so uh, party line is something that's intended to try to uh, improve that participation at events. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's got about 10 rudimentary commands and I've built on top of those building blocks to give more behavior. So, um, you know, I can say hi to everyone. Did everyone's phones turn to hi? Yeah? Okay, so I can make your phones turn different colors, right? So the first time I saw something like this, this is based on the work of uh, Seb Lee Delisle out of France. Um, he calls his project uh, Pixel Phone. Look it up, it's very cool. Um, I was kind of freaked out. Oh my God, he's taking control of every phone in the conference. And really it's just, you can't, you know, it's just a web page. It's using web sockets or polling. So it's not doing anything that anyone can't do on any web page that exists in the world. So don't worry about that. Um, Morris is just a worry word. So, so okay, what else can we do? Um, uh, this is a cool one. So let's see. Um, oh, oh, here's one. Uh, How, my, did, did yours load three buttons? Okay, how do you think I'm doing with my talk so far? Press a button. Oh, here, I got it. I'm gonna say um, medium. Okay, so now let's look at the results. Hey, that's not bad. Poor. <laughs> oh man. Okay, uh, let's see if I can fix that. We'll do another survey at the end. Um, okay, oh, this one is cool. Okay. Boom. 
boom. These are all the devices in the room, broken out by browser. I guess there's three that are unknown. Android is not flying high. And I would guess these safaris are a version of mobile safari that's not being categorized as iPhone. Um, so that's kind of cool. And okay, so I'm going to get out of this before more people shift to poor. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this test page. I'm going to come over here. Whoops, where was I? Da 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 da. Party line. And this was the functionality I added at like 3.45 today. Okay. There we go. All right, so without you guys doing anything, now we can go to browser scope and hit reload. And there's the data for all the browsers in the room. So using this, I was just able to do uh, testing on a wide variety of devices, thanks to your participation. Thank you very much. And it looks like um, IE Mobile is the only one that uh, where dynamically loaded images um, do not block the onload event. So that's actually pretty cool. That's they also IE. Uh, 10, I think, is the, one of the few browsers that does not block for asynchronously loaded scripts. So that would make sense that um, it has that behavior. Okay, so um, I'm sorry to say that was the fun part of the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Um, uh, as long as, until like 20% of the people stand up and start to leave, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes? Have you been exploring with RTC? The question is, is that? The question is, um, have I looked at WebRTC? And no, I haven't. I haven't looked at it at all. And IE11 is going to have WebGL, and I haven't done any kind of performance analysis or benchmarking on that either. Another poor. Yes? So why still based on all its best How has the mobile landscape changed with best practices So the question is um, why slow and page speed are these kind of performance lint analysis tools? Um, that were developed for desktop. Uh, how do they apply? How are the best practices different for mobile? The main thing is um, that uh, pretty much all the best practices for desktop, except for one or two, are applicable for mobile, but they might have a different prioritization. For example, on desktop, um, avoiding too many redirects is pretty like in the middle of the pack. But mobile, because networks are so slow and latency are, is so high, a redirect can be very costly. Uh, so like on the desktop worldwide average, a redirect is probably like 50 to 100 milliseconds. Um, on mobile, it's probably like 800 milliseconds. So that rule would be a much higher priority. Some of the rules for desktop that don't apply to mobile, if I can think of them, I know one is domain sharding. So the point of domain sharding is on the desktop you have uh, high bandwidth, um, but browsers will limit the number of parallel connections you can make by host name. So if you just shard your resources across more host names, you instead of getting six or 12 parallel requests, you can get 24 or 30. And with the bandwidth on the desktop and the CPU on the desktop, that actually works and it improves perfor performance. On mobile, uh, you don't have enough bandwidth, you start thrashing, and most mobile browsers limit the number of connections even more severely. Um, and so it's not a good thing to do. It actually hurts performance because you have more DNS lookups. Um, there was another one, best practice. And then there are some new ones, um, like 
Um, I didn't talk at all about uh, the RRC protocol and radio links and how phones and radio towers and carriers um, manage that connection. It turns out they're managed pretty poorly for performance and there are things that you can do to um, uh, improve speed, the user experience, but also reduce uh, power consumption on mobile devices based on knowledge about the radio link. Um, so there are some new ones, um, but in general, all the ones for desktop apply to mobile as well. Yes? What way to measure that speed difference between like a native application, like a native iPhone or Android application like the JSON call versus like an HTML5 application like the JSON call? Like a call back from the other? Uh, the question is, um, is there a way to compare, you know, native performance to um, like a mobile web app, specifically the question was about like a JSON request. So inside your native app, it might be a hybrid app, um, you're doing a uh, JSON request, which is basically just a request for a script. You know, how much faster or slower would it be than um, a JSON, you know, an Ajax request on mobile web? I would guess that there isn't that much difference. Um, but the question was, uh, is there a way to measure that? Not really. At Velocity, we're going to have two demos that touch on that point. One is from a new company called App Purify, and the other is from a company is from AT&T. They have a product called ARO. I think they say Aero uh, for Application Resource Optimizer. And there, we're just be obviously we need tools. We should have tools already to do that, and we don't. But they're coming, and so these are going to be these are some of the first products, at least that I'm aware of, that let you um, measure performance. Uh, as far as network performance, but also battery um, and CPU of uh, mobile web apps as well as native apps. Yes, in the back. Um, do you believe that uh, zipping a large JSON response over a cellular radio will increase the decrease? Or... Uh, sending a large JSON response over. The cellular radio. Are they compressed already, and therefore the zip is just unnecessary overhead? Um, Compared to what? Unzip. Oh, uh, whether it should be compressed? Yes. Oh, yeah, you should definitely compress it. Yeah, there's no doubt. So the radio network doesn't compress it already? Uh, they might do some kind of compression on it, but it's not going to be as good as if you minify and compress it yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, many sites hold a responsive design paradigm, but sometimes the sites and CSS files have media queries inside the CSS. And some sites have loads of CSS based on screen because in the HTML itself, they do multiple CSS that way. Which is a better approach? Um, so uh, they have CSS, they have media queries. Inside the CSS file, so there will be a yeah. queries for tablets, uh, mobile devices, versus an HTML file where you have big well screen media with loads of CSS. Where an HTML file where you have. Well, you can know a CSS. Yeah. Oh, um, so your question is, um, is it better to have a whole bunch of CSS for all your devices, but you specialize the CSS based on media blocks versus um, on the server looking at the user agent and deciding which style sheet to load? Oh, using a media attribute yes. on the style sheet? Okay, so um, should I just have a whole bunch of CSS with a media block um, based on min width, or should I use the, um, the media attribute? Uh, so Scott Gell from the Filament Group just blogged about this a couple weeks ago, and I think what he found, um, and I blogged about this three years ago, is that uh, the media attribute basically doesn't affect whether a style sheet is downloaded or not. And so even if the style sheet doesn't match, it still gets downloaded. It turns out three years ago that was generally true in all browsers, but some browsers, not a majority of them, but some of them have gotten smarter than that 
uh, today. So the results are a little better, but still on you know a majority a majority of your users are going to download all the style sheets regardless of whether the media attribute matches or not. Um, so it really doesn't. You know, it's probably faster to have one big one because there's less overhead, unless you're running speedy, of one request as opposed to five separate requests. Yes? Well, um, so the question is, um, it might be better to have smaller files so you could have kind of incremental rendering versus one huge file. Um, and unfortunately, that's not true for CSS. Uh, so what's the, comp are you talking about sprites? As opposed to? Well, uh, yeah, so for images, um, uh, you know, sprites, sprites make a lot of sense as well as doing, you know, inline uh, data URIs for um, smaller images. And so uh, uh, if, the, if you have like, you know, 10 or 20 kind of logo icon sort of graphics, that is better to sprite than have separate. But if you have, like certainly if you have like a background, you know, a large uh, image, that would be better to have separate. Uh, so your question was, what's the breaking point? You know, I would say you, you know, if an image is more than 10K, you probably don't want to sprite it. So people are kind of clearing out. I think um, we should call it. I'm going to uh, stay here. Um, if people want to come up and ask questions or explain what I could have done to not be graded poor, um, then uh, I, I would like to listen. And again, thanks to uh, Nicholas and Shiv for, and Box for hosting us here. Thank you very much.